Well, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paulig Murphy. You're all very welcome here. Uh, you might like, before we begin, to turn off your mobile phones. Um, it's my honor to present today uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for Foreign Affairs of New Zealand, Winston Peters, uh, who is here in Dublin for uh, a very important occasion from our point of view. He opened a resident uh, embassy of New Zealand in Ireland in Dublin yesterday. Uh, he is going to speak to us today on small states, big ideas. Uh, if there is another uh, small state in the world uh, that we in Ireland identify with more than any other, perhaps it's New Zealand. Um, it is uh, at the antipodes, uh, from our point of view, but I suppose from the New Zealand point of view, we are at the antipodes of New Zealand. But the um, position of small states in the world is one uh, that we are greatly concerned with here. Um, and I think um, I can say that our concern is shared by our friends in New Zealand. The concern arises from uh, what has been described by one commentator as the return of the jungle to international affairs. Uh, the return of the jungle means that big beasts are back on the scene and we small states have to figure out how to deal with that. And one of the conclusions that we here have drawn is that uh, we need to work with other states uh, that are concerned with this in order to preserve the rules-based multilateral order under the United Nations, uh, which is very important for small states. In our case also, of course, uh, membership of the European Union is extremely important in this connection. So, Minister, we look forward to hearing your views on uh, small states, big ideas, and thank you for coming. Uh, Rory Quinn, uh, Patrick Murphy, uh, former Ministers Alan Dukes and Martin Mansay. Close? Manson. Manson. Um, the Excellencies uh, from the embassies of uh, Mexico, Australia and Hungary, uh, Alan McCarthy and uh, New Zealand Ambassador for the last few weeks and for the inaugural position, uh, Burgess. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, this morning and for the chance to speak to you. Of the many things that New Zealand and Ireland have in common, one is that neither of us view our size as some sort of excuse to be a mere, to be a mere spectator to world events. We've always seen it as both our responsibility and indeed a necessity to fight for our fundamental values to create the kind of world that we want to live in. We are small island nations, uh, populated by proud peoples, and despite our size, we have never been afraid to speak up for ourselves and for what we believe in, or dare I say it, to take the consequences of standing up to bigger countries. There's a well-worn adage, you know, you're either at the table or you're on the menu. We have entered a period of dangerous uncertainty in global affairs. The system underpinning our security and prosperity for the past 75 years is under, under precedented stress again. The values and norms on which this system rests, democracy, respect for human rights, open societies and open economies are under attack in a way not seen for generations. But when we voice those phrases, 
human rights, democracy, uh, open societies, all of a sudden they have an acuity of meaning which requires us to be more sincere in our expression of them and in our defence of them. Uh, the commitment of key players to the global rules-based system, which has regulated trade and reduced conflict between states, is now, uh, sad to say, a matter of uncertainty. And we are seeing efforts to reshape the world in ways that do not always support our interests or respect our values. For small states like New Zealand and Ireland, we have much to lose from global instability and the abandonment of values. This is surely a real and present danger. It's a real and present danger which calls us all to lift our game, our level of commitment and sincerity of what we stand for. Uh, the old way of performing as politicians and, dare I say it, as ambassadors and high commissioners won't do. There is an intensity required of us which is borne about by the emergencies in terms of international circumstances that we face. In short, we need to fight for our values and to assert our interests. It's not surprising then that both New Zealand and Ireland have made strategic decisions in the past year to expand our diplomatic engagement. For us, we're growing our presence across Europe. Uh, as you know, yesterday, their first New Zealand embassy in Ireland was officially opened, a milestone in our relationship with Ireland and for our deeper engagement with the European Union membership. And last Thursday, in Stockholm, we opened our New Zealand embassy there. This investment comes at a time as Europe undergoes its largest geostrategic shift in decades as the United Kingdom exits the European Union. As we work through the implications of this, both for the region and for our own interest, and as we deepen our cooperation with European partners on issues ranging from climate change to global security, and as we launch negotiations toward a free trade agreement with the European Union, our commitment to our European partners is stronger than ever. And for Ireland, we're pleased to see your government's decision to double its global footprint through the Global Island Strategy and the impressive decision to open 26 new posts globally over the coming years. It's clear that the Irish understand what's required now, uh, when others in terms of their economy and attempted frugality in terms of the cost of the public purse when it comes to the diplomatic footprint, seem to think that somehow the alternative uh, will do. You clearly don't think that, nor by the same token does, for example, Singapore, who have a similar approach uh, to increasing uh, their investment in that respect. We are particularly pleased with the focus on our region, the Asia Pacific, and we're delighted to see more of Ireland in our neighbourhood. You might ask why, as part of this, we have been we have both decided to open embassies in our respective countries. Why have we chosen each other and uh, why now? The obvious answer to this lies in our shared history and heritage. Put simply, we have kinship ties. One in six New Zealanders can claim Irish ancestry. Uh, but that, as a statement, doesn't do justice to the enormous contribution that Irish New Zealanders have made to building New Zealand and to the development of our national character and identity. This contribution dates back to the earliest days of European settlement. Irish settlers played a central role in the European settlement as leading politicians, jurists, and public servants. And some of our most illustrious prime ministers have claimed Irish ancestry. Then to some, uh, then to some of our least illustrious ones <laughs> have also. And our first premier was James Fitzgerald, who was from Irish background. Uh, John Balance and Michael Joseph Savage, the architects of New Zealand's welfare state, and of course our current Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, claim Irish ancestry, as does our Governor General, Dame Patsy Reedy. Many of our most successful business people have been of Irish stock. 
and Irish migrants and their descendants have been some of the most active and passionate advocates for social justice. And much as it pains New Zealanders to admit this, Irish DNA has made a considerable contribution to the success of our national team, the All Blacks. <laughs> um, Dave Gallagher, captain of the famous original All Black team that toured Ireland, Britain and France in 1905 and 6, was from Ramelton, County Donegal. And many of our finest All Blacks as well have come from that background. Can I just say though that there's something else that's common about Ireland that New Zealanders share and that is we don't like having um, class-based systems rammed down our throat. We actually think that Jack's as good as his master. That's what the character of New Zealand became a long way back. That that's the reason why we'd gone all the way, all the way around the world to start a new type of society where someone with a bit of chance and effort could, with hope and sacrifice, go all the way to being the Prime Minister. There's something sort of slightly rebellious about the New Zealand character that is an obvious fit with the Irish, <laughs> without being critical. Speaking of rugby, we haven't forgotten the brilliance of the Irish team, uh, which went out with a better strategy in Chicago in 2016, made sure that we played the whole game in our half, and when we panicked, beat us. We're not going to make the same mistake on Saturday, <laughs> but then again, you've got a marvellous New Zealand coach, and uh, he might just outthink our guy, which we hope um, in the end uh, won't matter because if you really want and you really love sport, you need to have the best competitor possible to make the game worthwhile. As you all know, we have another match, as uh, you know, on this Saturday at uh, what used to be in my time known as Lansdowne Road, uh, but which has changed its name probably for commercial reasons. Uh, and we've always found it always better to open a diplomatic post when the host nation is in an optimistic frame of mind. <laughs> it could be a whole lot harder if I was here on Monday trying to open this embassy. <laughs> Many of our most famous and celebrated artists and musicians are all right, also of Irish heritage. Just one in particular for the young people here. Uh, this sensation is named Lord whose surname, for those of you who don't know, is actually O'Connor. And uh, that's sort of enough said, I suppose. This story continues to evolve with each new wave of Irish immigrants and visitors to New Zealand. And much of the Christchurch rebuild after the disastrous earthquake in 2011 came from Irish tradespeople who called uh, when we uh, asked for their assistance, who answered the call and set out to rebuild the city. And uh, in a way, we're pleased that some of them didn't go home because we've got a huge building or housing crisis in New Zealand where the demand far outstrips the supply and we're trying to get on top of it as fast as we possibly can. We have 10,000 visitors from Ireland every year, including more than 2,000 young people under a very popular working holiday scheme. All this is without even mentioning our love of Irish whiskey or the more than 65 Irish pubs in New Zealand. Our decision to open an embassy in Dublin is less about our shared past than it is though about our desire to share a future. Our links of history mean we have an ease and comfort with each other that makes us natural partners, both bilaterally and on the world stage. Our fierce sense of independence is combined with our innate sense of fairness and natural justice. We are both willing to stand up for ourselves while never losing our sense of humour and our ability to laugh at ourselves. That said, there are several areas where we hope New Zealand and Ireland will work more closely together. The foremost is climate change, where we are fast running out of time to avoid catastrophe. The very idea that we can go on with climatic dispolation and degradation is, you know, when you look at the number of scientists who support this idea, is rather ridiculous. So we need to intensify our efforts to identify practical solutions. Uh, we're already doing this in the agricultural sector, where we are both members of the Global Research Alliance, which seeks to reduce agricultural emissions 
while enhancing production to feed a rapidly growing global population. We would also welcome Irish participation in New Zealand initiatives to promote uptake of climate friendly <laughs> agricultural technologies and practices and to facilitate action towards meeting our ambitions and our ambitious goals for achieving carbon neutrality. We have long been close partners in demanding the complete elimination of nuclear weapons, including our shared membership of the New Agenda Coalition. We both have proud traditions as contributors to peace operations around the world. And New Zealand certainly tried to defend our values during our recent membership of the UN Security Council. And we're confident Ireland will do the same if elected, which we support, in 2122. And New Zealand is pleased to refer, as I say, reaffirm its support for Ireland's candidacy. And we stand ready to promote whatever help we can as you prepare for membership, including talking to our Pacific neighbours. Both New Zealand and Ireland are also committed to open and inclusive trade policies that provide opportunities for all of our citizens. We understand that serious difference when it comes to globalism and trade. Globalism and trade must be for every person in your country, not just the elite, not just the multinationals, but everybody from the top to the bottom. That's the trade we believe in, fair trade, free trade, not some sort of uh, abuse of democracy while you promote elitist, narrow ob economic objectives. And we both understand the importance of global trading being a system of fair and transparent rules. We will need to fight for these rules in the year ahead, in the years ahead, in the WTO and elsewhere. And surely we understand that the WTO is under some serious threat at the present time. And we need to hang on and assure that we maintain it and its essentiality into the future. As we both seek to expand our global reach and influence, we will find no more natural friends and partners in our respective regions. And as both of our regions undergo significant change over the coming years, we are well placed to share experiences and learn from each other as trusted partners. Ireland is one of New Zealand's closest friends in Europe. We will rely on Ireland for advice and support as we strengthen our relations and practical cooperation with the European Union. We have been very grateful for Ireland's support for the launch of negotiations between ourselves and the EU on free trade. We hope we can now move quickly to conclude a comprehensive, high quality agreement that serves as a model for progressive and inclusive trade policies. As the European Union evolves post-Brexit, we also seek Ireland's insights on the nature of these changes and what they might mean for Ireland as well as for third countries like New Zealand. In turn, New Zealand has much to share from its knowledge of East Asia. And over the past two decades, New Zealand has been fortunate to benefit from the most rapid expansion of the middle class in economic history occurring in our region. Rapid growth in East Asian economies has provided us with significant opportunities. We've worked hard to embed ourselves in the institutional architecture of Asia Pacific, including through an extensive network of free trade agreements to ensure we're able to fully capitalize on this. And given our experience, we can tell you what some of the pitfalls for us have been. We were the first developed country in the world to sign a free trade agreement with China in 2008. We we're also at the forefront of negotiating the now now comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, which involves 11 Asia-Pacific countries with provision for others to join, representing a significant step towards bringing down barriers to trade across our region. New Zealand has also much to offer on the Pacific, a region that welcomes constructive partners like Ireland and the EU. The Pacific may seem distant, but it is strategically important, and increasingly it has become a contested space. We have seriously increased our focus and support for our Pacific neighborhood, and this strategy provides for strengthened cooperation with constructive, like-minded partners such as Ireland and the EU. 
We welcome the contribution you are making to the region, both in terms of development assistance and your commitment to shared values, and we want to remain close partners. Plus, it makes plain common sense. If we band together with our resources together, it'll go a whole lot further, a whole lot more quickly, and we will get on top of the problems and difficulties we face. If we go about it separately, academically, humming and hawing as to whether it's a good idea or not, uh, enormous opportunity will be lost, which will be most, so much harder to roll back in the years to come. So we need to act collectively now. Finally, there's much more we can do together in terms of bilateral cooperation. In particular, there is considerable untapped potential in our trade and economic relations, as I've said. The links are currently fairly modest, with 400 million in two-way goods and services traded annually. We can, must, and should do a whole lot better than that. Uh, New Zealand also provides untapped potential for Irish businesses seeking a foothold in Australasia and East Asia and Asia Pacific. We boast one of the best business environments in the world, having been consistently ranked number one in the world for ease of doing business by the World Bank, as well as second in annual prosperity and economic freedom indices. A number of New Zealand and Irish companies are already taking advantage of these chances. But as New Zealand reaches our natural limits of production in a number of sectors, we're looking for partners to enable us to meet demand in fast-growing global markets. There's much to be gained by New Zealand and Irish farmers working together. And there's much to be gained by pooling our knowledge and expertise in agri-tech, in a whole lot of areas as well. Given our isolation, New Zealanders have always been pioneers finding practical solutions to solve problems. It's an attitude to get stuck in and get the job done at the heart of many of our successful New Zealand businesses and technological innovations. You may be aware that now we even at this time have a thriving Kiwi company launching rockets into space called Rocket Lab, which has driven uh, us as a government to launch a New Zealand space agency. In turn, Ireland's innovative creative and digital sector offers potential for collaboration and partnership. Westbourne IT have already set up operations in New Zealand after considering everywhere else in Asia Pacific. They chose New Zealand because of the ease of doing business and the close alignment of New Zealand and Irish values. We expect more companies will decide to follow their example. And this week, a delegation of Maori entrepreneurs, these are the indigenous people of, this, of New Zealand, and investors, including a number representing the IT sector, are visiting Ireland in search of inspiration and partnership. And as an aside, can I just say that uh, I am myself half Maori and half Scottish. There's nobody perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, one half of you wants to get drunk and the other one doesn't want to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> Could you keep that private, please? Um, <laughs> another, uh, and by the way, they left uh, mainland China via Taiwan 5,000 years ago. DNA is irrefutable. Another area for current and future collaboration that's very clear to my and dear to my heart as Minister of Racing is the racing industry in which Ireland is a world leader. Uh, we went to uh, <coughs> Pranskura, Ireland's iconic and world-renowned race course yesterday, and we also were impressed by the uh, development of the Irish National Stud, which we also saw yesterday. Uh, the success of New Zealand's world-class horse racing industry owes a great deal to Irish bloodstock and the contribution of Irish New Zealanders as breeders and administrators. And perhaps our most famous uh, legend in the horse industry is Sir Patrick Hogan, whose passion for the thoroughbred is a legacy back home and in Australasia, and indeed around the world, passed down to him by his Irish father, Tom Hogan. Uh, Sir Patrick Hogan had the wisdom and the presence of mind to pick a very unlikely champion that became known as Sir Tristan for breeding purposes. And the most difficult horse to handle was our most successful uh, breeding sire, 
and his offspring, Zabil, carries on that tradition. <laughs> it's just some of the areas in which our people will benefit from in our governments taking a long overdue step of opening resident embassies. Can I say this, though, uh, with sincerity and personally? Uh, because back home, uh, my view on Ireland has never been shared with the greatest uh, degree of um, uh, generality and broadness as it should have been in this sense. I came to Ireland in 1981 and I saw the beginnings of a great economic plan, which utterly amazed me because the image of Ireland in our part of the world is of uh, sometimes fractious people. But across the political divide was this agreement about where Ireland would go forward. And in those dramatic years, we saw Ireland become famous as the Celtic Tiger. And despite a recent blip, if you go from there, which I saw in 81, to there, and there's a slight blip in your land than there, that's a whole lot further higher than there. And they had every explanation. Oh, Ireland's in the EU. Well, so is Portugal. So is Spain. So was the UK. Uh, or they had to give some other lousy excuse. But in the end, uh, personally, I was a huge admirer of the enormous success story where you waltzed past us. And although our populations are the same, your economy is $110 billion greater than ours. Boy, have we got things to learn from you. I'm saying that as a personal justification of my support for the starting of an embassy here, which is hugely, hugely overdue. We can learn a lot, in short, from Ireland's brilliant story. And today's global environment of uncertainty and instability, it's never been more important than now for friends like us to work together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, New Zealand um, is not a mere spectator of world events, uh, neither is Ireland. And as you laid out uh, your view of uh, the stage of the world and the problems facing the world, it's fair to say that we are like-minded countries. And there are many uh, historic and cultural reasons for this, which you have also um, set out. So it's no accident, as used to be said, uh, that we both decided to open embassies uh, at more or less the same time. Uh, you have um, set out um, a list of areas in which um, Ireland and New Zealand can uh, cooperate to our mutual benefit. Um, I am sure that we um, in Ireland will be willing to uh, cooperate with you. Um, as to uh, the events of next Saturday, um, I'm no expert, but um, I am, uh, let's say, uh, fundamentally pessimistic. Uh, our only hope is that uh, you haven't come here just to open an embassy, but maybe also to poach our rugby coach. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Minister. We now open the floor for questions or comments. Uh, in asking a question or making a comment, uh, perhaps you would say who you are and what your affiliation is. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Minister and Deputy Prime, uh, Prime Minister. The, the, the modesty of um, the tone of your speech was inversely proportioned not to the excellence um, of the content. Um, my name is Mark Coleman. I'm from IBEC, and I had the privilege of a few years ago hosting uh, a dinner um, for members of our organization with perhaps the most beloved New Zealander in Ireland, that's Brent Pope. And it was a couple of weeks after uh, New Zealand had won the World Cup again. And we asked him, I asked him from the chair, what, you know, what insights can you give us on New Zealand's victory on the rugby pitch? And he said, well, two things. He said, first of all, we give all our players from all our schools equal opportunity to participate in the game. And you made reference to the importance of not having a class system. And it's more an insight than a comment, I think, if there's one reason why the European ideal is more popular in Ireland and globalism, globalism is more popular in Ireland is because I'd like to think we've already taken your advice in trying to make the globalist project reach more areas of our society in terms of uh, 
balancing and buffering against the negative shocks that do happen. But the second advice uh, that Brent Pope gave us was uh, the New Zealand team always focus far harder on the second half of the game, whereas the Irish team tended to get a bit complacent if they scored a few tries in the first half. I think we've had an excellent couple of years in the in recovery in the last couple of years, but Brexit will certainly mark a half-time whistle, and I hope that we can keep up the second half. So now my question to you, um, can you, and I, we are under Chatham House rules, are we not? Oh, we're not, okay. It's under record. Well then, I'll keep it very, very general. Can you comment at all um, in terms of the geopolitical situation in Asia Pacific? I'll keep it very general because I don't want to ask a specific question. And relate it, if you can, please, to ten trade tensions. Yeah, before I do, could I just say that uh, I can recall uh, watching a game in 1991. Uh, it's the closing eight, and a uh, team is playing at Lansdowne Road called Australia, and Ireland is winning uh, because a loose forward got away from a, about 60 metres and scored this fantastic try. And it's a closing minutes, and Ireland has got uh, Australia right near its own goal line, and the... Uh, Australia's got the ball up to the halfway line. She, uh, won a line out against Ireland and got it up to the uh, five metre line out from the Irish uh, goal. And then they scored this incredible try. That's not what I remember most about though. I read all the articles from the Irish newspapers in the days after that. And if you want to see some literary talent, you want to see the, <laughs> the explanation for this event, right? It's just incredible. It's fantastic. It sort of, uh, you realise, here's a population, same size as ours, and the level of uh, literary quality explaining a disaster <laughs> knows no bounds. Uh, I was also, sadly, there the week later to see New Zealand play Australia, where we got beaten at Lansdowne Road, and uh, it was rather horrifying, really to think that that happened to us. And uh, we had to end up playing against uh, Scotland and for the third place on the Wednesday next week. Mm -hmm. But that's yesterday's story. Mm -hmm. uh, of the, the circumstances in our part of the world is that a, a country that Churchill once said to leave <coughs> dormant like a sleeping dog for one day would wake has woken up some considerable time ago. It is a one-party state. That's the difference. And the <coughs> president has change the constitutional rules around his continuance in that position. Um, we face uh, a country whose uh, resolve and long-term range planning is something totally foreign to Western minds. And in those circumstances, it makes our do job so much more difficult, combined also with the, what I would say is an appalling naivety or bordering on arrogance of so many people in the political system surrounding them who think they understand what they're looking at. With the greatest respect, they don't. Because they don't, begin, they don't begin with respect. If you respect a country like that, you will know the, the level of uh, difficulty you're going to face. But if you think somehow, by some accident, you are their long-term strategic planning equal, then that mistake would be seriously uh, one that will, time will cost us all. That said, there, have been, there has been a dramatic shift in our part of the world, uh, perceived perhaps more by us in politics than others, but in the space of 15 or 20 months, and it's huge. Japan has also gone from being apathetic to seriously stepping up. We sense from Indonesia, the biggest Islamic country in the world, which is also a democracy, a concern to position themselves. So is Thailand, but then, a country like Vietnam, where you would think there would be a sort of a mutuality between themselves and China, is showing for the umpteenth time their thousand-year independence and desire to be so from China. And dare I say it, if you look really hard at North Korea, you may be looking at a um, very much misdescribed regime of a young man who can't surely hope to go the next 50 years like his father. And when you look at that, and I know how we have an aversion to nationalism, 
but there's different ways of describing nationalism, uh, as opposed to what President Macron said the other day uh, in Paris. There's nothing wrong with nationalism if your desire is to lift every one of your people from the bottom to the top. Uh, but rabid populism, nationalism, which has no other purpose than to just be that, which uh, we, uh, the image and, and shape of which we've seen countless times before, that is to be uh, criticised. Uh, but in our part of the world, uh, we, we are hoping that the various governments and across the political divide will have their eyes wide open and as quickly as possible. If that happens, then we can help by our influence and our competitiveness to better shape China's future. And that's all I can say. Paul yes. Obronikon, um, Deputy Prime Minister, a question to ask you, basically referring back to, I think you spent some time uh, in economic ministries. What big idea dominates um, internal New Zealand economic policy. Uh, I ask that because uh, about 30 years ago, um, Roger uh, Douglas um, gave a paper which was reprinted in one of the, the Institute of Public Administration's journal here, but he gave the paper to the Mont Pelerin Society, which, um, as we know, um, uh, is very influential in economic policy making in the States at the moment and also in Germany but not in France, and we're part of the Eurozone, and we therefore face a clash of two basically fundamentally different ideas on, on uh, let's say, economic policy making internally. So what big idea dominates in New Zealand uh, economic policy making internally at the moment? You've said it's free trade, but internally, what is it? Uh, that's a fascinating question, because I just uh, say that um uh, Roger Douglas, uh, to uh, quote Shakespeare, in 84, cried havoc and let loose the dogs of inflation on our country where the overnight rate lending got past 1,100% in more than three nights, where the interest rate was 19.5. All of this was predicated on the basis that you're going to have three years of pain and now you're going to, after that, have three years of gain. The very idea is preposterous in the extreme. Now, I looked at Ireland, and I've watched as best I could from the outside your development, and the Irish economic experience, which has been a dramatic success story, has precursors in uh, Singapore and in Taiwan, dare I say it, and in, in, in Hong Kong as well, uh, because it actually accepts that there is a role for the government to intervene to direct an outcome if it's wisely positioned. Whereas we took the view back in July 84 that the government was the worst thing to have involved in the economy. Somehow the market would sort it out. Uh, it's a very touching idea, uh, but uh, we've never seen such an experiment tried anywhere in the world in 10,000 years of recorded history and being successful. But I'm slightly biased, right? Because uh, I saw it at the very time and I call it the Erebus economy. Erebus was a plane crash we had, tragically. We had the whole. Uh, plane was travelling with all these tourists and the uh, uh, autopilot and all the controls were beeping saying pull up, pull up, they didn't. Well the same thing was happening to our economy as well. Uh, today in New Zealand, it's the first uh, since uh, the 26th of October last year, was the first attempt by a government to turn around the worst effects of Rogernomics. The first genuine attempt to make a statement and confront the business world and say this is not working. That after 33 years we've fallen down the OECD and you cannot mean to keep us there with the pretense that somehow this experiment, un working as it has been for 33 years, is somehow, somehow going to come right. I made the contrast of Ireland coming roaring past us because when I was young, per capita, we were number two in the world. Our Minister of uh, Labour, who handled uh, the unemployment figures, knew every unemployed person because they're only 29, not 1,000 or 100, just 29. So we were a great success story, and then we shared it. Uh, uh, we were a property-owning democracy with one of the greatest housing uh, ownership ratios in the world, where for 25% of your income, you could pay the mortgage, the insurance, and the rates. And the other 75%, you could live on with the family. 
Look where we are now, 50, 60 percent weekly wage going into uh, the families that are struggling, and we're trying to turn that around. So this is a coalition government where we have, um, above all, a realist <laughs> and are setting out to ch change to a far more fair society, but at the same time we are making deliberate interventions to boost our regional uh, infrastructure, to boost our added value in the regions, to boost our production and to boost our exports. Because for a country like ours, we the export or we die, and we're going to go for broke to rebuild the earnings and added value capacity of New Zealand and get ourselves back to where we'd like to be, where we used to be, one of the chosen countries of the world. Uh, can I just say, way back in 1893 is a long, long time ago, at the first time formation of party government happened, a man called Seddon said that New Zealand is God's own, but the devil's own mess. <laughs> well, we're still God's own and we inherited a bit of a mess, but we want to fix it up. Thank you. Um, Malcolm Byrne is my name. I work with the Higher Education Authority and thank you Minister for your contribution and commitment to the values of global cooperation uh, and internationalisation. One area where we can certainly learn from New Zealand, where New Zealand has been particularly successful, is in terms of the internationalisation of education and as an export market, I think international education is something like the fifth or sixth biggest export market uh, now in New Zealand and the change has been dramatic in the last uh, decade and a half. It's something that we're trying to develop uh, in Ireland at present. What lessons do you think uh, that we can learn from New Zealand's internationalisation experience? Well, uh, the, br the briefest way I can answer that is that if you go into this market, there'll be a number in academia which will persuade the politicians to do that, uh, but you must ensure that they don't tarnish the country's image. If you're on the international market, and you're taking international students, you're to use the Latin phrase, you're in loco parentis, you're there to look after their children in your country and treat them properly, not for exploitation, but to deliver them a world-class education whilst looking after them and never compromising your own educational standards. My country, sadly, made the mistake of allowing that to happen. And then to try and prop it up, we started to say, well, we'll give one in five residency, so we'll keep the attractiveness not based on educational quality, but based on a different package, which was never part of the deal. Fortunately, we've uh, turned that around since the new government changed to try and strike back for excellence in delivery and maintain our standards. So uh, not doubting the educational fraternity in any way, but you must make sure that they don't compromise your nation's integrity. Ireland's got a reputation for being world-class in education. And uh, as a young person coming here a long, long time ago, I saw that the, your tragic export was your highly educated young people going somewhere else in the world. The great change in Ireland has been your belt to turn that around. And, and we also had the same thing happen to our country. They were heading off everywhere but you know, Sydney, uh, off offshore to the UK, anywhere else. Uh, we hope to sort of keep them back home now and give them a better future. But it's difficult. Good morning, Prime Minister. Thank you. I'm Matt Dempsey from the Farmers Journal and the National Stud. It was a great pleasure to have you out there the other day, or yesterday. Uh, I understand that you have imposed quite stringent new laws on the acquisition of property um, by overseas purchasers. How does that square with your vocation to increased openness of your general economy uh, and, and your approach to what we would agree with a liberal world trading order? Oh, well, now, that's a fascinating question. Of the things that we are seeking to increase, land is not one of them. <laughs> so, if, you're the great, listen to us. They always told us, oh, you can't take the land with you. And I always wish, used to say, really? Go and look at Ireland. Because the domination of Ireland was from outsiders in terms of land ownership and everything else uh, in this past history. And so we are saying, look, uh, you can lease land in New Zealand. You can come and start this and that. And you, in fact, if you come and you want to live in New Zealand, you can buy a farm as big as you like tomorrow. But you've got to come and put your future, all your sweat and your equity into the country. We're not having parked up offshore ownership, any absentee ownership anymore. And if you want a house in New Zealand, well, come and live in it. Don't buy 50 houses that I know some people have done in Auckland and become a landlord. Uh, as some sort of um, bolt hole 
in case the country of your domicile goes bad. We want people putting their heart and soul into our country, and we've used the experience of Ireland when it comes to land ownership as one of them. You can buy a home in New Zealand. You can buy any land you like in New Zealand. We just require you to come and put your future into New Zealand. However, there are some exceptions. If you've got an extraordinary added value proposition, we'll certainly look at that. We'll look at it case by case. But the days when you could walk in with not so much as to buy your leave or get citizenship within three days because of some jacked up political arrangement as somebody did, those days are over. True. Uh, Jill Donoghue, uh, Director of Research at the Institute. <coughs> uh, you mentioned in your warm and wonderful speech uh, a reference there to the uh, New Zealand campaign for the seat uh, of the UN uh, Security Council. And I just wanted to commend to you Jim McClay, who was your then ambassador, uh, who really raised the bar in terms of how to run an excellent campaign and followed by Jared van Bolman under the auspices of a half Fijian, half Scottish uh, Peter Thompson, who was the PGA. I wondered, following on from Peter's campaign uh, on the implementation of the SDGs, how successful have you been in New Zealand in terms of adopting an all-of-government approach to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals? And all of, look, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I've noticed that these days, their acronyms these days are so frequent that you have to explain to me what you mean by an SDG. At the Sustainable Development Goals. So oh, fantastic. you mentioned yeah, wonderful. climate change. I thought there, it was a right? form of voting. <laughs> 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 like STV, which you have here, oh, right? No, no, no. Uh, Thank you. Uh, you want to know where we're getting to there? Uh, we have made it a serious objective. We've set a can, uh, our, our plan to be carbon neutral in 2050. And we're going for broke on this because. Um, with the evolution of modern and rapid development of modern science, we think we can make it, whilst at the same time endeavouring to get on and top of and handle our agricultural emissions. And that's not going to be easy for us to do, but we do think that there are scientific breakthroughs, including dietary provisioning for animals, that could make a substantial difference, even to the extent of one third. Uh, how are we going? Well. Uh, we've, we call it the nuclear issue of our age, the climate, the, uh, climate change, so to speak, and, and uh, we've always believed, and we luckily have three parties, two in, are in government, the other one's got a confidence and supply agreement with the other party, but we believe that good environmentalism is good economics, we're setting out to prove it. And one of the reasons why we've opened in uh, an embassy in Sweden is to re-engage with the Nordic, or engage for the first time in the way we should have a long time ago, with the Nordic economies, who understand that you can both be green and have extractive industries. That in fact, extractive industries are critical for the green future. That is, they are so practical compared to some of the uh, countries around the world where they are confused about that. And if you go to the Nordic countries and look at what they've done, it's actually stunning in, their, in terms of their success. And we want to ensure that when we say that we are pure, clean, and green, that those words are true. Yes. Um, Eamon Delaney, a former diplomat and commentator and author. Uh, you didn't talk about the um, Small Advanced Economies Initiative, which New Zealand formed and which Ireland is a member of, I think the six or seven states. Maybe you could talk about that briefly. I'd love to talk about it, but I don't know enough about it. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Can I ask you a supplementary? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I used I, to be the treasurer of my country. That was 21 years ago. Yeah. But now well, I think it's a, a newly yeah. developing group. But yeah. uh, when I was a, a young diplomat in the UN General Assembly, the big thing was the parallel with Ireland and New Zealand was the bigger neighbour, Australia in your case, and um, Britain in ours. And that was a very interesting dynamic between the two countries. So maybe we could talk about that briefly? or. Well, like I, tell, like I said, in this, con in, in this context... Psychologically, culturally... Yeah, but like I said, in this context, when I was a young boy, uh, New Zealand was l way ahead of Australia. Our currency was much stronger, our capital income was far greater, our housing, and, uh, unemployment, everything was uh, outstripped Australia. And I noticed that that is the phenomenon that you've achieved in modern times when it comes to the UK. You are way ahead of the UK, in nearly every respect. 
But when I was young, it was the reverse there. Ireland was seen as you know, a bit backward, uh, not developed and um, <coughs> not doing as well as other economies. And you've turned that around. Uh, I'm not here to try and ingratiate myself with you. It's a fact. You've done it. Uh, one of the things that um, concerns me is that whereas we are still capable of outperforming Australia, the economic strategies that we have followed mean that we have not been able to do so thus far. But if we can rack up, and we've got a better growth rate than them now, we can rack up some decent growth performances over the next 10, 15 years, then we'll do much better than we have done in the past. Uh, do we have an inferior complex about Australia? We never had it when we were young. Our currency was worth 130 to their one. That's what it was when I was first going to Australia a long, long time ago. I'm not the most ancient guy in this, <laughs> in this room, but it wasn't so long ago. Um, and I can't say much more than that. Uh, you know, it's never been a matter that's held back Singapore. Singapore has been a staggering success story. It's never held back Taiwan, and yet Taiwan would have the second highest population density to Bangladesh, has no resources at all, and the economic performance in that context has been staggering. Uh, that's why we've watched Ireland, because the number of features of Ireland's economic development and its cross-party plan have Asian features about them. Well, thank you very much, Minister. Sorry, Ron, did you want to? Uh, my name is Ron Hill. I'm a former academic. Uh, now I'm a member of the Institute. I was in your wonderful country for the first time, possibly given my age to last, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And I was very, very impressed indeed, I must say. Uh, now, c comparing Ireland with New Zealand, Ireland is, of course, a member of the European Union, which is very close. Your nearest neighbour is a thousand miles or more away. Does this make a significant difference to your development plans, your aspirations? You talked about yourself as part of a much wider, much wider unit. Um, how realistic is it to use Ireland as any kind of model for um, uh, development uh, and economic, economic development? When we were taking ourselves in the late 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s to uh, in the top three in the world, we had massive geographic distance then. Mm -hmm. It's just something you have to combat. Uh, we, uh, we, 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 we are really realistic about that. The serious feature, though, that makes that capable of being handled better now than in those days was an understanding of what added value and top of the market uh, exports look like. Uh, where your product gets so much better uh, outcome rather than bulk and where others are adding value. So instead of selling milk, we should be at the top of the infant formula business, mm -hmm. which is 45 to 50 billion internationally. And then there are families that don't want milk infant formula. They want goat milk. I mean, not dairy, they want goat milk or some other type of milk. We should be doing everything we can there. And dare I say it, that's where Scandinavia is a standout record. We have over 5 million cows, they have 350,000. But if you were to look at the comparative added value of those two economies, they're doing better than we are. So we've got to pick up our act, and then a ge a geographic distance will not be the tyranny that it can conceptually seem like. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, and uh, thank you for the spirit in which you and both presented your main presentation and in which you responded to the uh, many questions and comments. Um, when you set out uh, the international agenda of New Zealand in terms of climate change and the particular agricultural aspect of climate change, uh, the complete abolition of nuclear weapons, uh, participation in peacekeeping operations around the world, uh, support for the United Nations in the shape of uh, active membership of the Security Council, and uh, globalization and free trade for everybody, uh, you could, of course, be talking about the international agenda of this country. Um, I do recall uh, some 30 years ago uh, New Zealand was regarded as in the same category as the Scandinavian countries and uh, it is from the uh, consideration of that I think that we 
have always considered New Zealand a like-minded country, just as uh, we consider the Scandinavian countries like-minded countries. At this time when, uh, as we were saying earlier, uh, the rules-based international multilateral order is under some threat, it is good to hear uh, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of New Zealand come here and make such a wholehearted <coughs> commitment to precisely this order. So we thank you for coming, we thank you for opening an embassy here, and we wish our bilateral relations all the best for the future. Thank you.